Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the nitty gritty um, in terms of field identification. <clears throat> and I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> Imagine that. take a drink first. Documentation, why is it important? Um, we're basically, we're determining population. Um, it identifies each individual horse in the population. Um, it individually is going to track treated and untreated mares. Um, tracks full recruitment. And we're identifying successes using PZP and missed opportunities or windows based on breeding season. It's also going to help managers be accountable and to strategize for the future. Uh, the more information we have, the better we can make informed decisions and see our successes. So the importance of observation. Knowledge behavior is key to your success. So I'm talking about being on the ground, watching horses, knowing that animal, how it reacts um, to your presence is really going to be important. How do we approach them to observe? Familiarity of a herd in advance before contracepting is going to work to your advantage. So how do we figure out population? This is a daunting picture because there are a lot of horses out there. How are we going to figure all of this out? So let's look at some things about wild horses. Where do they live? Where do they go? What time of day do they go to water? Um, patterns can change seasonally um, depending on resources. Do they have summer and winter ranges? Do they stay near their water sources? All of these things are important um, in figuring out where the population is located. Large or small groups, do you see them in single harems? Or are they running in large herds with many harems? Now, a lot of you guys use bands or groups. I'm, I call them harems because that's how I was taught. So um, it's all the same. Um, do, you, uh, do they run in large herds with many harems? And, or are they scattered out all over the place? So trying to figure out where these horses are hanging out, who they're hanging out with, that's important. Then you want to get out and you want to ask these questions. How do the horses react when I approach? Um, that's really important. Are they curious? Are they wary? Can you approach them on foot? Um, will they only tolerate a vehicle? Are they afraid of approaching by foot, vehicle, or both? Um, bring a rangefinder, and if you're going to be field darting, um, see how close you can get to these animals, because um, that's going to determine your distances and whether or not you're actually even going to be able to field dart them, because maybe you won't be able to. So I classify them as at least four kinds of herds. There are the tractable, easy to approach. You can get really close. They don't seem to care. Um, that's kind of like the Prior Mountains is like that, uh, Spring Creek Basin. Um, you also have your tractable and weary herds. These herds, um, some are easy to approach, but some are kind of apprehensive. Um, they're approachable, but they keep their distance. Um, places like the little book list is, is kind of like that. Um, and then you have your wary horses. They're unable to approach on foot, and they're suspicious of vehicles. And I worked in the Cedar Mountains for years, and this basically mirrors the Cedar Mountains. They were wary. I couldn't approach them on foot. I collected all of my data by literally stalking them and trying to sneak up on them. Then you have your highly elusive herds that, you know, they can hear and see you approach from a vehicle miles away, and usually you're just seeing their dust. So you're not really even seeing them. Um, they're hard to observe. Um, you, they run when, um, when you see them on foot or in a vehicle. Uh, places like Corita Mesa, um, Hog Creek, and Cold Springs in Oregon. So field documentation has many strategies, and strategies are going to be different in every single herd that you're in. The movements and how you approach horses is going to be um, something that you're going to have to consider. Observing them at water sources, that's a really good way to make observations. You can be invisible um, and collect a lot of data. Um, wildlife cameras are very exceptional for um, getting identifi identification of horses. Um, and bait trapping, you can actually, if you're bait trapping, you can basically get identification from these horses. Even when you're, you know, there's gathers in that, you can still 
um, get good identification off of the horses. Um, using natural and unnatural blinds can be also effective. So strategies are limitless, and patience is really important. If you're not a patient person, this is probably not going to work very well for you because you have to be patient. So approachable to elusive, just some field strategies that can mirror darting strategies. So we're thinking, you know, you never walk. These are the approachable horses. You can you never walk directly to, towards the horse. You use angles when you approach. Um, you keep the stallion between you and the mare. Um, don't chase. It's really important when you're tracking horses is not to chase the horses because when you're allowing that much pressure on them, they remember that. So you want to be able to only allow so much pressure and be able to relieve that pressure. More elusive and wary horses, you might have to do a lot of stalking. I did a lot of stalking in the Cedar Mountains. Um, wear camouflage or natural clothing, that helps. Staying upwind, um, their senses are really keen. Um, be still at water sources. Uh, people that can't, that have to move around, this isn't gonna work for you. You have to be really still for long hours at a time um, in order to do observations. Um, and staying at a water source summit to sundown. Basically, when it's really hot in the summertime, this is an ideal time to basically kind of get a handle on the herd because you're going to have a lot of horses coming to certain water holes during certain times of the year, and you can collect a lot of uh, data on horses that you may not see on a regular basis. So what kind of equipment are we going to use? A good DSLR camera, good lens, binoculars, um, wildlife camera or trail cameras if you have them. Um, spotting scope and tripod. I can use a spotting scope and I can see off in the distance and I can say, hey, I have information on that group. I don't need to mess with them anymore. Um, or I need to get more information or I need to go dart those mares. Um, that can be very beneficial. GPS. If you're exploring the area, trying to figure out where the horses are hanging out, you're looking at horse sign, or you're finding seeps and springs, that may be beneficial. That's really good. Also, so that you don't get lost. <laughs> Trust me, I've been lost before, and a GPS is a wonderful tool to have. <laughs> um, carry a field notebook. You know, write information down um, about the animals that you're observing. You know, the day, the time, you know, even the weather. Um, all of that's beneficial. So I'm going to get into basic stuff. This is really basic. It's not rocket science, um, but you want to do horse identification. Um, you're documenting individual horses based on their color, face marking, leg markings, their main side, and unique identifiers. Um, but you also want to identify them by their group as well. So these group associations, you're ranking them from their stallion to their offspring. Um, in when you're darting horses, a lot of times you want to dart that lead mare last, so it's kind of important to know who that lead mare is. Um, you know, you'll note who the satellite bachelors are, dogging bachelors recognizing individuals of a group by their colors and group numbers. That's important because I might be able to start identifying individual groups um, and say, oh yeah, I've got treated mares in that group, or I need to identify that group. That stallion has five bays, that dun horse has uh, two grays and a liver chestnut. First things first, you want to do face markings, so you're recording all the uh, kinds of face markings, and then you're basically recording leg markings. Make it simple, make it consistent. Um, we use just four things, coronet, pasture, and socks, and stockings. No half stockings allowed. Um, main side, parted, left, alternating right. You know, you don't have to use this if you can already identify a horse really well already. Um, sometimes this is beneficial if you can't, if you've got nondescript horses. You've got unique markings. Familiar markings can be used as descriptors. This stallion has a femur bone on his head, so you can identify this horse really well. We called him femur because he has a femur bone on his head. Um, paint patterns, obviously there's, um, you know, paints are very descriptive and easy, but if you're looking at a lot of paint horses out there, you know, you might want to find little descriptors in those paint horses to be able to identify them. This guy has a little heart on his side. Um, you will have your own way of describing the horses. So other descriptions. When it is not so obvious, how do you figure out these nondescript horses? Um, you want to look at the small details, and sometimes it's difficult to do. Um, scars are important. Solid horses. 
courses basically with no markings. You know, there's dark gray or dark bays, there's light bays. You know, you have to find something subtle about them that, and solid horses, I mean, basically no markings whatsoever, no white on them. So you're looking for those subtle details that it's going to help you determine who that horse is. Gray horses are really difficult too. A lot of times they've got the pink on their face, which is, um, shows designs in that. So you're going to be able to identify them that way. Um, a male penis. <laughs> Ironically, uh, my friend Dan came up with that because he was trying to identify these male horses and he was just like, hey, you know, he's got a little pink on his penis and it's an identifier. Um, as crazy as it sounds. Um, mane and tail colors, that can change over time. Um, gray horses are going to change over time. So trying to figure out these little non-descriptive things. Summer and winter coats summer and winter markings. So essentially, you know, those roan horses are going to change color during winter and summer. In the winter time, you're going to have um, markings that become bigger and fuzzier and not defined. And then in the summertime, they're going to be crisp and clean. But you want to be able to identify that that's the same horse. You know, there's two horse heads here. What heads do those horses belong to? Can you identify them? That's, that's the key. You can ask me later. I'll tell you. Um, what I did in my experience, I created a horse list, um, and it's an Excel spreadsheet. Basically, it's constantly changing document using the field to identify horses in their harems and individuals, and it's going to help you survey and monitor the population. Um, so I carried this horse list with me. Once I know those horses and that, I don't have to use this horse list that often, but I list it as gender and rank, color, markings, mane and tail. Uh, you're born if known, and then we always attach an identification um, to them, so a number identif identifier, um, and then location if that's critical or important. And this is what basically a horse survey would look, look like. Um, you can track the treated mares as well. The coloration is, uh, are the treated mares, who the foals are, if there's any foals, um, individual horses. Um, what's important about it? Um, harems are listed by their hierarchy. It's, you start to recognize harems by the color and their size. It's a quick information um, about that harem. Um, how many are in the harem? Is anybody missing? Is there anybody new? Um, it used as a markings reference, um, tracks location. Um, were they observed in this year? I put a highlight on the left-hand side of the column, and then as I see horses, I remove that highlight, and then by the end of the year, I know who I didn't see that year. Um, it tracks treated and untreated mares. Um, is that stallion now a bachelor or vice versa? All these things. So um, Now I'm going to talk about WIMS, which is Wild Horse Identification Management System, and this is an access software program that I'm pretty biased, I really love this program, but there's other programs out there, so not everybody likes this program. Um, Ron Osborne, who worked for USGS, created this program with somebody else, and um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, his contact information is there, you can ask me later, uh, Wildwise Solutions. Um, and he created this for horse management, basically, and it has all the things that you might use for managing horses. It has markings, they're a picture catalog, ID, fertility control, everything that's up there. Um, and this is kind of a little bit what that looks like. So um, you have your horse and there's pictures. You can put as many pictures in there of that horse as you want with their identifying features. Um, you can query, you can edit, um, you can put their, if they have a brand, you can put their brand number on there. Um, there's other markings. The thing I love about this program is the filtering. So the fact that I go out in the field, I see a horse, I'm like, I don't know who this horse is. I take pictures, I come back and I look and I'm like, okay, there's this bay with a star that has a right front pasture and I'm going to look at that in access. I'm going to query it and it's going to bring up all those bays with stars with right front pasture. And then I'm going to be able to look through that catalog as long as it's in the catalog and know whether or not I've already identified that horse or maybe it's a new horse. Um, so it's definitely a, a thing that I used frequently, especially when you have a lot more horses. In smaller herds, you know, 
it's easier to identify, you know the horses pretty well already, it may not be necessary, but in a larger group of horses, um, or more elusive horses, it's definitely very beneficial. Um, um, there's contrac contraceptive treatment programs, so you can plan your treatments, and then you can also have the actual treatment listed. Um, vital statistics, basically, um, the year the horse was born, and why is that important? Well, for contraceptive treatment, well, maybe it's good to know or guess when that animal was born to know whether or not um, you need to move up your treatment of that animal. That's really important to know. It's like, oh, I missed my window. We need to start darting these animals earlier if we can. Um, so photographic identification and its benefits. Um, now, these horses are sand wash horses in that, and so I know a lot of you that work, or maybe not any of you, I don't know, it, people that work with herds that are really difficult to photograph, you know, this, uh, my horses in the Cedar Mountains were not like this. <laughs> um, the, the pictures weren't as, as, as close up. Um, but the benefits are you get to see the health of the horse from year to year and know from year to year, hey, this horse is healthy from year to year. Um, documents and tracks that you saw that horse in the calendar year, so you're kind of keeping track of the population. It's showing all the markings for that animal. It's going to show any new markings that you might come upon. Uh, changes in color during winter and summer. Um, changes to mane and tail. Take a lot of pictures. That's really important. Take every side of the horse if you possibly can and taking pictures of their uh, whole body and their face. Close-up face, especially for horses with nondescript markings, it's really beneficial um, to take those close-up shots because sometimes you have similar horses and you might have to compare photographs. Other people like photo catalogs or picture books, which is beneficial as well, and people use them and it works for them. So there's so many different kinds of ways that you can um, document, and but documenting is important, so, so do as much as you possibly can. So next step, after you've identified horses in that, we can go on to darting if we have our contraceptive program in place. You want to incorporate your strategies, um, and I talk more about strategies in our, in our class at Science and Conservation Center, so if you've not been, you should come, um, and we'll talk more about strategies. Um, have proper field identification so you know who you're out there darting. That's really important. Document, document, document. Be responsible record keepers. Um, basically, putting everything down about the darting event um, from time to dose, what the adjuvant, this is for PZP, delivery system, injection site, uh, vaccine number, lot number, you know, whether the dart functioned, you know, did that dart go off? That's really important. Um, <coughs> you know, any reactions, and if there's a reproductive history. Not, you may not know um, all of the horse's reproductive history, but if you do, that's a benefit. That's definitely a benefit. What else can we observe and record? Um, population demographics, age classes, body condition scores, you know, mortalities, group associations, um, recording foals to mares to be able to identify um, the mares and their foals. Well, wait though, how can this even be accomplished? That's, it's really daunting, it's a lot of work, especially with your larger herds. Um, how is this even possible? I tracked horses in the Sierra Mountains for nine years and um, it was challenging by far. Um, you know, I couldn't walk right up to these horses. I, it's like hunting, I spent a lot of time shimmying down gullies, hiding behind blades of grass and sagebrush, hoping that they wouldn't see me and run off um, because they inevitably would if they saw me. Even if I was hiking at a distance and they saw me, sometimes they would just take off running. So I had to strategize on how I could get close enough to be able to photo document all of them. I spent a lot of time at water holes, which was really important because um, I gathered a lot of information there. So there's so many different kinds of strategies. People are really creative on how um, they can do this work. So accept the possible, because it is possible. We can do this. Um, you've got dedicated managers and administrators, and hopefully they, they don't leave. Um, at, I'm going to use Astigue Island as an example. You have the same people that were managers and administrators, and when somebody left, that program didn't go away. It stayed in place, which is really important. 
and then you had basically um, that same person that was monitoring and tracking the horses and, and doing the work from year after year after year. Um, volunteers, people are just, you know, crazy about volunteering. Um, and I know sometimes, you know, people are, you know, BLM and maybe Forest Service are nervous about using people because maybe people are a little bit emotional about the horses, rightly so, but maybe they can be beneficial and helpful. Um, and I had a guy in one of my training classes say, hey, he's just like, yeah, he's just like, well, she's sort of emotional. I'm like, well, go and educate her. Kind of feel her out what she, you know, is interested in doing, and maybe she'll be helpful. And then maybe you won't have to remove her favorite horse um, because maybe she'll work with you in trying to, uh, you know, make this happen. Dedicated and passionate groups, there's lots of those out there. Kim's going to talk more about that later on. Um, interns from universities. When I first started in the Prior Mountains, Linda Coates Markle, she had interns um, that came out and they did little horse projects all over the range um, that helped monitor the population and the range. Um, and it was largely beneficial. I was a seasonal employee for years and I love this type of work. This work was just really exciting to me. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. So you could hire some seasonal employees. But I would have loved it to be my career. So consider creating full-time jobs dedicated to this work. Um, I know budgets and, and that, but let's think positive And um, hopefully we can keep on going. The end. <laughs>